Uh, so I want to I want to get this right because um, this person's resume is so impressive. Uh, do you know Roberto Salinas Leon? He is the executive director of the Atlas Network Center for Latin America. Currently, listen to all of these: president of the Mexico Business Forum, president of the Alamos Alliance, senior debate fellow and debate lecturer at the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. I love Silent Cal. I wish more presidents were like Calvin Coolidge. A little hands off, a little sexy. Uh, he's also an adjunct. Thank you. Yes, let's hear it for Calvin Coolidge. We don't we don't give it up to him enough. I think that's very important. Uh, also, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. We love the Cato Institute. He's published more than 2,000 editorials. Um, he's on CNBC, bleh, uh, BBC. I can have him on my show just so whenever anyone reads his bio, it's like, oh yes, and a frequent guest on the Fox Business Network. Um, and listen to this. He has a BA in political economy, history, and philosophy. That is the trifecta from Hillsdale College. You know who went to Hillsdale College? Cat Timpf. Cat Timpf went to Hillsdale College. It's here for Cat Timpf. Yes. Our Fox Nation viewers right now are very delighted about that. Uh, but I'm, I'm most excited because, uh, and Michigan, blah, blah, blah. They're part of the Big Ten. UCLA is going to the Big Ten, so now we have to hate all those schools. Sorry, Ohio State. He has a PhD in philosophy from Purdue University. He is a boiler maker. I love it. Let's get this summit going. Please welcome Roberto Salinas Leon. Mm. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Roberto Salinas. Uh, there's a tradition at Freedom Fest that Mark Skousen has uh, very generously invited me to moderate uh, these panels. I'm very grateful for that, but uh, these, are, these panels are also extremely challenging because Mark asks us in 25 minutes to basically turn the tide and solve the world's problems. Well, at least we can get a good discussion going, and I think we have an absolutely spectacular uh, panel uh, to do this with, with our good friend Barbara Colm that has traveled from all the way from Austria and Barbara, it's wonderful to see you again and uh, also in person, uh, meeting again in, in Las Vegas. You and I have been through these uh, exchanges uh, before. We also have the, the great Steve Moore that is going to tell us how to unleash growth and, and prosperity. Um, uh, Priti Upala is the first time here at Freedom Fest and she's gonna tell us a little bit about what's going on in, in, in India and in the, in the Southeast. And of course, Jim Rogers, another person that is very well known uh, to us here at Freedom Fest. So please welcome uh, our, our panelists. So let's, let's get right to it. Uh, 2022 is literally being 2022. Radical uncertainty is once again uh, all over the place. It is, it is absolutely widespread, widespread. And this has generated what seems to be tidal waves of uh, autocracy, of greater economic centralization, and of quick fix solutions by many bureaucrats and, uh, um, and would-be central planners that think that they have magic wands and think that they have a quick fix solutions. In the midst of all of this, the transitory infl the inflation that was supposed to be transitory now has turned, turned out to be rather permanent. And those uh, in the uh, millennial and centennial population groups are waking up to something that uh, uh, had not been seen in, uh, in 40 years, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, these uh, double digit, almost double digit uh, uh, inflations, in some cases like in our backyard, Argentina, for instance, and Latin America, Venezuela, they're facing triple digit inflation. Once again, the 1980s hyperinflation is coming, is coming back to us. I'd like to start with Steve Moore, uh, who has a, a great uh, daily email uh, uh, about uh, unleashing prosperity. And Steve, you were surprised in yesterday's comment that you shared with us 
about the uh, inflation report that came out uh, at 9.1 percent, and 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 certainly. I don't think anybody thought at the beginning of the year that the United States would be facing something that we haven't seen in 40 years. What's going on and what can we do about it? Well, uh, it, it's very simple. I mean, we have people in Washington that have no idea what they're doing. And so, um, you know, I look at it very simply that, you know, that period between Reagan and Trump was a real freedom revolution where we had incredible prosperity, the greatest period of wealth creation in the history of civilization. And, you know, when you look at these inflation rates now, you're right, it's 9.1 percent on the consumer index. I don't know how many of you saw this morning the news that the, uh, that the producer price index, uh, you know, which is the cost for businesses to put goods on the shelves, that rose by 11 point, I think that was 11.2, 11.3 percent. So those are really, really bad numbers. Those remind me of Jimmy Carter and, and, and you know, Nixon, Ford and Carter, that era. And, um, I would say this, that it didn't happen by accident. The, the match that lit this forest fire of higher uh, inflation was unquestionably the massive amounts of uh, debt spending we've done over the last four years. And, and, you know, Trump deserves some of the blame for this. We did two or three trillion dollars. And, um, and by the way, let me say something. Never, 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 never again should we let government shut down our economy. Never, never again. Never should we allow them to shut down our schools. Never should we allow them to shut down our parks, our, our, our churches. This was, the, in my opinion, the most outrageous power grab by government ever. And by the way, the statistics are crystal clear, uh, almost irrefutable, that lockdowns did not protect the health of, of the American people or people around the world. <laughs> lockdowns do not work. And I am very worried, I am very worried that the next time we have some kind of a strain of virus, I guarantee you the left is going to try to shut down the economy again. We can't let that happen. I'll make one other quick point and then turn it over to the others. That um, this is pretty amazing that if you go back nine months ago, Roberto, there was a major piece, I believe it was published in the New York Times, by 15 Nobel Prize winning economists and 30 to 50 of the most prominent economists at American universities around the country. Mm -hmm. And they all said, and I don't know if you remember this, they said in this note, don't worry, Biden's policies will not cause inflation. That's what, I mean, you, you can, these are supposed to be the, the best economists in the country, and it shows why people don't trust economists, because they got it completely wrong. I mean, this is like, you know, having a doctor that amputates the wrong arm. I mean, so they got it completely wrong, and that's because you still have this Keynesian influence in the economics profession mm. that believes that government spending is a positive thing. But when you flush $4 trillion of, of money of spending and borrowing into the American economy, it, it's as sure as the sun is going to rise in the east and sun in the west that you're going to have rampaging inflation. And that means we have to, sh we have to stop the government spending monster, period. I'll get back to that, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much for those insights, but especially in, in recapturing the principles of prosperity. Now, Barbara, uh, that same mentality seems to be pervasive in, in Brussels and the European Central Bank. And we wake up this morning and, again, another surprise, another 2022 moment is the euro is less than parity. What is, <laughs> is going on? Is this also a consequence? of this uh, um, monetary expansion and this, uh, and this idea that just by printing more money, MMT, uh, I want to ask Jim Rogers later about MMT. Um, what is MMT? Modern monetary theory. Uh, John Taylor says it's neither modern nor monetary, monetary nor, nor theory. A theory. <laughs> so, Barbara. Well, and by the way, Karl Menger actually in 1907 was disputing a certain German professor called Knapp and he was actually arguing the same thing stupidly about monetary theory already back then. And Menger, the Austrian professor, said, no, this is bullshit, it will never work. <laughs> Sorry my language, I just had to, to tell that. But uh, following up on what Steve said, I mean, we have the same issues, we are just even later in Europe. We did not do the right thing with regards to uh, Q, QE, we did it more and more. We had the APP programs, we had the PEP programs, the pandemic per, uh, emergency per, purchasing programs for COVID. We did all the lockdowns over, and now we have the war in, in Ukraine going on, so we have actually three external shocks that 
surprise, surprise, all of a sudden they are here together mm -hmm. and then this rises the tide and it creates even more tension and even more disruption. And we have no tools at all because Brussels and Frankfurt are still collaborating. As, as a matter of fact, there should not even be a telephone line between the two. They should keep monetary policy and fiscal policies uh, apart. And this has not happened in Europe for the past uh, decades, at least ever since the EU got that strong. And we have this centrally planned economy out of Brussels. So this is one reason. Second thing, sovereign debt, we have already touched upon that. Finally, we rise our interest rates for the first time as of this week, you know, 0 0.25 is the first raise in, you know, and the world almost, is ending because almost they, they, 11 they rise, years, right? yeah. 11 years after, for, after being negative. I mean, this is a no-go. And then, because what is interest? The price for money. I mean, our star, the natural interest rate is down. We, mm -hmm. You know, people don't even know that. So then we have the, the COVID lockdowns, which were the disaster for Europe, and which now brings also an energy issue. And I think this is worth discussing separately, but Russia is really being on war with the rest of Europe. And uh, as of now, gas is still running to Europe. Nabucco has been, one of the pipelines has been shut down uh, earlier this week on the 11th. And um, just for fixing reasons or for service reasons, uh, I think everybody can assume that it will not be reopened again. And our politicians were unable uh, to allow the industry to look for alternatives and the market to find solutions. So it will be a rather cold winter in Europe Unfortunately, now is the winter of our discontent. It's exactly, it's not Lady Thatcher. It's uh, I think all over Europe and not just Britain. Uh -huh. uh, it, it will be more than discontent. It will be pretty rough, but that's also provides us opportunities because people see that the socialist policies simply don't work, and that we must not go top down and be you know be told you have to be locked in, you have to follow what those guys say, and it doesn't work. We know it, but uh, the sanctions will also fire back uh, to the European industry. It already does on both sides. Uh, in the industry, look at the car industry, for example, in Germany, it's more or less done. More than. And uh, sad to say, and uh, also on the financial markets, we, we see it. Jim, speaking of uh, financial markets and of, uh, and of uh, what we claim to know, um, China seems to be following the policy of lockdowns, this, this obsession with zero COVID and everybody stay at home, and, and, and once again entering into, into that zombie economy where you have a collapse not just of demand but also uh, uh, of supply. Is this sustainable? Is this what's going on? And is once again, are we once again facing in China and in Asia another wave of the easy solution to, uh, to go into QE whatever? Well, as Steve points out, lockdown has rarely been successful, not been a very good way to build an economy or to build a society. I cannot speak for the Chinese, obviously. I'm, I'm American like, like you. But that is the approach they've taken. It's certainly not going to help their, their economy or our economy. And whether they I don't know why they're doing it. You can ask them. I live in Singapore. Singapore locked down for a while. It was not good for Singapore. I did not have, agree with that's the way to do it. But again, these kinds of politicians are not very smart. That's why they get government jobs. You know, they couldn't get a job in, couldn't get a job in the real world. But I want to alert you. We're, we're going to have very serious problems in the world coming up. You may remember 2008, we had a very bad problem because of too much debt. Look out the window. Since 2008, the debt has skyrocketed everywhere in the world. So the next time we have an economic problem in the world, it's going to be worldwide. It's going to be the worst in my lifetime because the debt is so, so, so much higher now. The central banks around the world do not have a clue. It's been a long time since we had a good central banker. We had a couple, we had one in America in the 
60s. We had one in America in the 70s. India had one five or six years ago. He's gone. He's, he's at a university now. Just shows you what happens to the smart guys. So it's going to be extremely bad, the worst in my lifetime, and I'm certainly older than many of you, and you should be extremely worried. Is this the beginning of it, what we're seeing right now? I mean, is this the beginning stage of that crisis? Well, I, I, I wish I were that smart, but my answer is probably. Uh -huh. But what I would suspect will happen, something will happen in Ukraine, some kind of peace, I hope, because it's a very foolish war. They all are. But if something happens in Ukraine, oil prices will come down, grain prices will come down, and so the central banks will say, oh, everything is okay now. We don't have to worry about inflation. They will see that the economy is bad, so they'll start printing money again. I and they will print as fast as they, they'll print until we run out of trees. I mean, they're not very smart okay, people. Okay. And then the, some of you may remember that in 1980, U.S. Treasury bills yielded over 20%. That's not a typo. <laughs> over 20% because things were so bad. Be very worried. Be very, very worried. It's coming again. Pretty. should we, we also be worried about India? There's a, a, a lot of talk about, remember 20 years ago, it was all about the BRICS, right? Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, and China, Jim O'Neill. So now it seems to be the BRICS upside down. Is, is, is India part of that equation? Uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Hope you're having a wonderful panel. Very uh, riveting. Um, I've always said this, that, that this is the Asian century. The next 50 years will be Asia's. And I think what happens there affects all of us. And it's something that we have to take uh, you know, very seriously here in America. As far as the Indian economy goes, very quickly, I just want to talk about three things. The economy, inflation, and the future. As far as growth rate uh, go, uh, it still remains the fastest growing economy in the world, even post-pandemic. So before the pandemic, it was closer to 10, and uh, it's 8.8 .8, uh, this year, uh, forecasted uh, for um, uh, 6.5. And um, so during a pandemic, to have those kind of growth rates is still good. Thankfully, it's bounced back. Uh, just to compare with the U.S., uh, U.S. is expected to grow at 1.7% next year and 0.8% in 2024. We must be so worried, um, uh, just in general, you know, and obviously what happens to America uh, ripples across the world. But specifically about India, as far as the inflation goes, um, the... Um, uh, I mean, I guess the geopolitical uh, events of the last few months have had different effects on, on different countries. India happens to be the largest importer of cooking and edible oils in the world. Right. Now, those prices have fallen dramatically, and that one thing alone has saved um, the Indian inflation rates and the economy in many ways. It, the inflation rates are at 6% right now. Pre-pandemic, they were at 3%, which is very healthy. So I don't suspect an inflation, thank God. And I don't, uh, I mean, sorry, I don't suspect a recession yet. I, th I think we will bounce back. Um, and just to end with the future, I think as patriots and as Americans, it's not wise to compare just China and India in terms of economy and growth. I think we have to understand that these are two very different countries mm -hmm. that mean different things to the world and to the global order. One is a, an ally and a strategic partner. The other is a greatest adversary and yeah. the greatest th threat that we face right. on the planet today. And it's sad that we have taken our eye off the ball because of other conflicts that are happening right now. So just as Americans, always keep that in mind and, you know, work with your allies. And I've always said, American foreign policy, they don't know who their friends are, they don't know who their enemies are. They sleep with their enemies and That's they true. screw their friends. That's so that true. must change. <laughs> so Thank you. I feel the future is bright, I have hope. And, uh, even though we're sleeping with the enemy. <laughs> oh, even though, well, we must stop sleeping with the enemy. And uh, just to end, guys, if you're interested about China, what's happening in Hong Kong, Taiwan, all of this is going to unfold in front of our eyes in the next few months. 
um, Anthem Film Festival, part of the Freedom Fest, is showing a movie at 1.30 p.m. on Jimmy Lai and the State of Affairs in Hong Kong. So please check it out. Please catch that movie. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. <laughs> Pretty, thank you. We have we have eight minutes to turn the tide. <laughs> <laughs> so that that that, uh, that distribution equal distribution of minutes implies eight minutes. But I have to talk about Latin America too, so I might uh, abuse my my privilege. Barbara, you said something really interesting uh, backstage about how this is forcing us to rethink and and not to rethink, but to sharpen the skills and in, in the way that we um, communicate the principles of prosperity that we all know and love. This well, might be the turning of the well, turning yes. of the time. I mean, the, the global order as we knew it, the past World War II order, doesn't exist anymore, as we can see, it, obviously. And we have not learned from the uh, from the mistakes of the 70s that Jim already mentioned uh, briefly with regards to inflation. And so there is an option and opportunity in looking at the defragmentation. I'm not using the term that the European Central Bank has just invented to save certain countries, um, but the, the fragmentation of certain uh, continents. Because I think collaboration is something that we as libertarians, as pro-market people who believe in market-based solution have always done and it has worked. So collaboration and uh, getting those to do the right things that, can, that they can do best. So those are two, actually, tools that we need to use, get out of politics, let them do their thing, but that be us, be individuals, be individual ent enterprises and collaborate and intervent and uh, innovate and get new things out on the market. And this is, I think, the truly important thing. And get rid of all those sanctions because the sanctions that we see will hurt Europe more at least I mean, from a European perspective. US is too far away, but it will hurt Europe much more than it does harm to the Russians right now. And that's, that's the big debate that we're having in, in Latin America, by the yeah. way, on, on the uh, protectionist instinct that has yeah. re-emerged and, and, and you know, the idea of autarky. I'm, I'm not a big fan of Keynes, and I would never, especially in a room like that, quote him. But Keynes said something very wise after, in 1924 after Versailles treatment has, a treaty has long been done. And he said the following, the positive assistance um, to victims is better than the punishment of the aggressors. And I think we should keep that in mind, and there is a lot of money already on the plate that will support and help Ukraine rebuild it um, once the war hopefully is over soon. But sanctions, I don't think, is the right so way. So no sanctions, no lockdowns, those are two critical lessons. What else, Steve? I mentioned three quick things. Number one, um, we have to get rid of Joe Biden. <laughs> he is the wor worst president in American history. Um, and we, and, you know, it's not just Biden. The left has infiltrated every area of our federal government, and it shows. We just have a new study out, by the way, that shows that the majority, 62% of the people that Biden has put in place, I don't know if you've seen this yet, Jimmy, 62% of the people he's put in his cabinet uh, or in his top uh, you know, regulatory agencies or in the White House who deal with the economy, finance, or commerce, the 62% of them have never worked for a business in their oh, life. Yeah, 62% oh, yeah. of surprise. them. And that wasn't by accident. They put those people in because this is, a, this is an administration that hates business. So we need a regime change. And I'm with my buddy Larry Kudlow, who says the cavalry is coming. I think there's going to be a huge, massive sweep election in November. Uh, and then we'll see what happens in 2024. Number two, the greatest existential threat in the world right now is not climate change, it's climate change fanaticism. Yeah. Climate change fanaticism is an incredible danger to our country. If you want, if you want it, I always get asked this question, are these people doing to the American economy? Are they doing this intentionally? <laughs> By the way, how many of you think it's intentional? Oh, wow. A lot of you do. I, I don't know if it's intentional, but if you wanted to destroy an economy, a first 
world economy, a good way to do it would be to disrupt its energy supply. L look, look at Germany right now. Yeah. Exactly. Germany has We're doing exactly what Germany did. And so uh, this the... is so frustrating because we have more oil, gas, and coal in this country than any other country in the world. Uh, this, this country was built on fossil fuels. It what, it's what powers the world. And the biggest you know, problem with the, these green crazies is that, you know, the, that one out of six people in the world, including a lot of people in, in the third world countries, don't have clean water and they have energy poverty. And to take away their energy is inhumane. Uh, and then third and finally, I agree with you. I think China is an existential threat. I think Ch China right now is Germany circa 1936. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we better wake up to this. And Trump got that. that yeah. China is not a friend, they're not an ally, they're an enemy and an adversary and a dangerous one, and we better wake up to that. Jim, better wake up. Well, I will agree with we you. Have, we have a minute and 45 seconds between I will you agree and with you that <laughs> the 21st century is the century of Asia, whether we like it or not. Uh, there are many problems in Asia, there will be many in the future. She thinks it's India, I think it's other people, it doesn't matter, I just urge you, to please learn about Asia, because when the problems come, remember in 2008, it was China who bailed out the world and saved the world, but even China has a lot of debt now. So please, please figure out what's going on, because it's going to be very, very, very bad the next time we have problems. I think that Asia is going to help us, but Asia is going to have huge problems too. Be very worried. And to Steve's point, I said before, you know, none, of the, none of these guys can get real jobs. That's why they work for government. I didn't know the numbers were that bad. Yeah, it's pretty 62%. bad. Sixty-two percent. I mean, that's part of the main problem in the U. Not just the U.S. Any many other countries, they don't know what they're doing. So that's another reason to be very, very worried because they don't know what they're doing, and they will make it wrong, whatever they do. Pretty, you have. 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. How to turn the tide, be informed about what's going on in the world. Americans are very insular. You need to know geopolitically what's going on. That be informed knowledge is power at this particular point in time, and that knowledge will really um, help you. Be hopeful. Be positive. We are so lucky and so blessed to be alive at this point in time. Have faith that the democratic powers of the world will come together. Look, truth always triumphs, good always wins, light always wins. So just keep that in mind. And as for uh, politically, I think the U.S. needs to work closely with its allies, and I think together we can do this. Be I'm getting the red light. So. And no Latin America. Wait, 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 I gotta say one thing on no the way Latin America. I know, to, I know we're over time, but there, I'm an optimist. So I'm going to say this. The reason I know that America will triumph over China is because our Chinese are smarter than their Chinese, right? <laughs> yes. Jimmy, I think you had something. Hey, remember, America goes from Alaska all the way down to Patagonia. Yes. Huh? <laughs> and, and you so left we, that out Latin, so far. Latin America, uh, we'll have to pick it up tomorrow. We have a special session, Liberando, in Latin America to talk about the uh, wave of autocracy and the wave of uh, illiberal populism that has emerged in Chile, in Argentina, in Peru, and in, in my own country, Mexico. But I will end with this. There is a ray of very credible hope on the other side of Chile. Tiny little Uruguay is giving us a great example, not just for Latin America, but for the rest of the world, with Luis Lacalle Po's narrative about responsible freedom. Thank you all. Thank you.